Hi, I'm Joe from The Property Gurus. I'm here today to talk to you about loft conversions. You've probably seen all of your neighbours have been doing their loft. Um, and in these current times, everybody wants a bit more space. We're spending more time at home. Um, everybody's looking for home offices. So it makes sense to think about converting your loft. But where do you start? What do you do? How, how, how do you go about it? I've been developing properties for over 10 years. Uh, I've done lots and lots of loft conversions and I'm here to give you the quick guide to where to start, how to consider what you can do and how you start going about doing it. So the first thing, the very first thing that you need to do is, decide, is consider whether or not it's possible to convert your loft. Most houses have a hatch that you can access the loft and so I would suggest you go up, get a ladder, lift your hatch, take your hatch down wherever it is, sometimes in your toilet, sometimes in the hallway on the first floor and open up the hatch and with a torch, have a look at what's in that space underneath your roof. For most people, if you're living in a house that was constructed more than 20 years ago, you'll have a traditional loft void, which uh, is constructed using timbers and you'll be able to see that there's lots of angled timbers and there's a big space that you can easily convert to a loft. So the majority of houses in the UK are suitable for loft conversions. If you've got a new build house, then it may have been designed not to be available for a loft conversion. So you need to have a look up in there. And if you find that there are tons of trusses, so there are when you look up into the loft, it's riddled with wood and has been constructed in a sort of crisscross fashion, then you won't be able to convert that loft. That, that has been built with no future loft conversion in mind. The other issue for a loft conversion is the height of the ridge. So in order to build a loft that's going to have suitable living space, you need to have at least 2.3 or 2.4 meters of internal head height. So if you can see, when you look up into your loft, if you can see the ridge beam, which is the very highest point of your roof, which is right in the middle for most people, if you've got a traditional pitched roof with two angled sides to it, what you need to do is shine a torch up there and then see if you've got the minimum height. So if you can climb up into the loft, you can measure it with a tape measure, or if you've got a laser measure, you'd be able to just point it up and, and touch the top of the roof with the red dot. Uh, you need to have roughly 2.5, 2.6 meters of head height to be able to easily convert that loft, because that means you can build the dormer, uh, put some insulation in the roof and still have enough height to be able to stand up when you're up there. If you've got significantly less than two and a half meters of ridge height, then you're not going to be able to have big enough space internally to be able to convert that loft. Uh, you could still possibly do it by lowering the ceilings on the middle floor um, and doing some other creative stuff, but that's gonna be a lot more expensive and more difficult. So um, you need to have a serious think about whether you want to do that. The other way of really checking whether or not it's suitable for a conversion is to have a look at what your neighbors have done. So if there are a lot of houses in your street that are the same as your house, and you can see that they've already had loft conversions, then it's a pretty safe bet to say that uh, it'll be suitable for your house. Unless your house is very different to the rest of the houses or has a different roof structure, then it should be the same construction and it should be suitable for a loft conversion. So if your neighbors just had it done, then uh, you should be able to do it. Okay, so once you've worked out whether you've got sufficient space to be able to build the loft, you then need to consider how do you go about it? Because where do you start? Now, the first real point to consider is how much it's gonna cost. You know, we, we, we'd all like to be able to build something fantastic, but realistically, we've all got a budget. So you need to know, can I get it done for the money that I want to spend? And you've got a few options on loft conversions. So a traditional loft conversion that you'll have seen uh, everywhere uh, where you live is to take off the back of the roof and to build a dormer, which is basically square structure 
that protrudes out from the roof and creates um, the extra living space without having constricted head height that you have with a pitched roof. So that is the best way to do a loft conversion because you'll get maximum amount of usable floor space and the maximum headroom. But it's also the most expensive way. So if you can afford to do that, then I would definitely recommend doing that because it will give you a better outcome, better living space, and will increase the value of your home. If you can't do that, there are some other options. You can put some roof lights in, so put a Velux window onto the pitched roofs in your house, and you can strengthen the floor because the, floor, the ceiling joists are not designed to be walking on and putting furniture on and putting beds on and all the other things. So you need to strengthen the floor, but you can just put some roof lights in and create a triangular space. So you'd have constricted head height uh, in a lot of the, the area, but it is a lot cheaper to do that because you don't have to get, um, you don't have to do as much work. And there's, there's plenty of videos on YouTube that will show you how to do that. If you can afford to do the full dormer option, then that's definitely the best way forward. So the next question is once you've decided, OK, I want to do a dormer is roughly how much is it going to cost? Now, to get an exact price, you're going to need to get some builders to give you quotes and to get quotes from builders, you're going to need some drawings because they want to see exactly how it's going to be constructed. Now, there's two legs to those drawings. and I'll come on to that in a minute. But the first point is, is really to get some builders uh, to look at it in detail. To do that, you're going to have to get somebody to do some drawings. Now, you can pay a fortune for drawings for your property. So I would recommend that you shop around. It's crazy. People shop around. You go to the supermarket and people will have a look at all the different prices and compare different products and, and buy the one that's most suited to their budget. And then I hear about people doing build on their house and they get one build around, he gives them a quote, they accept it and they pay, uh, which is absolutely crazy. I mean, I've been doing this for a very long time and even now I will get at least five quotes for any building work that I want doing. Now, it may be that I use the same guys that I used previously, but things change, prices go up, people decide they want to charge more, they have craftsmen leave. There's a number of different things can happen on to a builder. So don't always take the first quote. Never take the first quote. Uh, it might be that the first quote ends up being the best, but you need to do your due diligence. You need to speak to people. You need to get some quotes and then weigh up all the options once you've got all the information. So to get those quotes, you're going to need these drawings. To get the drawings, you need to get some quotes from different surveyors. So there's a number of options here, but the best one, if you go onto the internet, uh, go into Google and type in drawings for loft conversion. And on that, you will then come up with a variety of, of results, but you'll be able to find um, a, a somewhere where you can compare prices. So it's similar to when you're buying car insurance and you get various quotes from various insurers, you can do the same with surveyors. Just type in that you're looking for drawings for your loft conversion and they will, these engines will find local surveyors who are interested in your work who will then email you. Now, some of them should send you quotes and that's what I'd always recommend. In your description state, I'm looking for a quote. So ask them to give you an indication because the guys who don't give you an indication will always be the ones who want to charge you the most money. And they will want to charge either uh, a, a, an ongoing fee or some sort of tiered structure where they charge you depending on how much you're paying for your loft. Don't do that. Get a fixed price. Ideally, you can find somebody for less than a thousand pounds. Now, I, I've always found people who will do the drawings for less than that, but it is expensive. You may find some people who try and charge you four or five or even ten thousand to do the drawings. Don't pay that. Never pay that. So have a look around. Find a two or three people for quote, who give you quotes for drawings and then speak to them, find which one you like the best, ask them how long it's going to take, what they need to do and just do your due diligence. Once you've done that, get them around and they're going to need to measure your house. So they will do top to bottom measurements because in planning, uh, you have to have accurate sizings. So they need to know how tall your house is, how wide your house is, how high the ridge height is in your loft. 
and then they'll be able to do some detailed, accurate drawings. So they'll do the drawings, and those sort of drawings come out in two ways. They generally have something like this, which shows you all the elevations of your property. So you can see that it's, it shows the, the side view of the house. This is a cross section here, uh, and, that, and then there's the front of the property. So these are the sort of drawings that you'll get, which show you, this shows the loft here. This is actually indicating what you'll end up getting. So they'll have that, but they'll also, in addition to the external views, they'll give you one of these, which is basically a layout of all the different floors in your property. And on that, you'll be able to see exactly what you're gonna get for your loft. So in this one here, you can see it's a nice big room with a shower room attached to it. So they'll give you that. And these drawings are important because not only are they needed for the builder, they're also needed when you talk to the council about either planning permission or permitted development rights. Uh, the other thing that they will give you is an indication of what you can get in terms of the, the room layout. So you can say you might want two rooms, you might want one room, you might want a shower room, you might want a bathroom, there's various options on that. So once you've got these drawings, then you can start speaking to the builders. So you can get the builder around, give him a copy of the drawings, tell him what it is you're looking for, and you should be able to get some quotes from that. And again, with the builders, don't just go with whoever you've seen on your local road or whoever the, your friend used. If they have got recommended people, that's always good. But I would go to, again, go to the internet, go to one of the, there's lots of different websites. So there's things like mybuilder.com, rated people, checker trade, lots and lots of sites where they have people who have to pay to be on them and they're all reviewed by their customers. So you'll see that people who've used them are actually saying, yes, uh, I've used them and they were great or these are the issues or they never did any, they never turned up on time, whatever it might be. So go on there and then you'll be able to post your job. So go on, say, I want to do loft conversion with a bathroom, um, all your details, and then you, and ask them again in that description for an indication of cost, because quite often the builders will say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a great builder, let me come round, and then they'll come and try and uh, give you a really high price. And, and it's awkward when you've got people in your house and you know it's embarrassing. So try and get an indication. And it might be some of them come in and say it's 50,000, some might say it's 100,000. You'll be able to gauge who you think are roughly the right people to talk to. Once you've got all those different quotes in, definitely get at least three, but I would recommend five people to come round and actually look at your house and give you a detailed quote. And you can talk to them about all the specifics. You can say, I want built-in wardrobes. Uh, I'd like extra lighting. I want to have a dressing area. Um, you know, I need to have uh, power jets in my shower. Whatever you want, tell them, because then they can include it in the quote. If you don't tell them, they won't include it in the quote. And then when you come to do the work, they'll, they'll be extras, and extras are a non-starter. Don't be getting into extras, because that's where builders really rip people off, because... If you ask for something that's not on the agreed quote, you've got no choice. They've got to do it for you because they're doing the work uh, and that's where you'll pay through the nose. So don't do that. So once you've got the quotes round, you can then decide which builder you like. And I would definitely say that you need to speak to at least three of their previous clients. So if you've got a couple of builders that you think, yeah, they're good guys. I like them. I like the way they, they talked about it. I could I could let them into my house. Then ask them for contact details for people who they've worked for before. Um, ideally go around and see at least one of those properties to have a look at the quality of the work. Definitely speak to the owners and ask them all the stuff that you're interested in about, you know, did they turn up on time? How clean were they? How quick were they? What was the quality of the finish? What happened after the build when they had problems? So if they had cracks or a leak or some issue, did they come and follow up and, and fix it or, or not? You'll be able to find out from those people whether or not they are happy because very quickly, if they've had a nice experience, then they will tell you, we, we love these guys. We think they're fantastic. We want to work with them again. If you don't get that sort of feedback, generally um, be cautious because if people aren't enthusiastic about their builder, then they're probably still not too pleased about the outcome. So do all that work. Pick, pick who you're going to go with, 
and then you've got your builder. So what do we do next? After that, you need to then convert these drawings. So these original drawings that we had from the architect, you need to change, you need to get somebody to make a structural drawing to show the steel work that's going to be needed in your property. And, um, and, the, and what I mean by that is when you do a loft, you can't just build the, the room above on top of your ceiling joists. As I said before, ceiling joists are designed to hold the ceiling up. So they're designed to just hold a piece of plasterboard that's painted with some lights on it. They're not designed for you to be for five people to be walking around on top of them on a bed with all the furniture and a bath full of water. Uh, so what you need to do is you have to put some steels into the property, which will go from one wall to another wall and support the whole of the floor for the loft. And that is a detailed technical drawing. Now here's one here I've got. You can see on this one that the red lines, the red lines are the steels. So here we've got a steel going from this wall all the way across to this wall, steel from this wall all the way across to this wall, and then a steel that joins the two of them here. So this structure of three steels will then be fixed to this wall on the outside, the party wall down the middle, come back to that in a minute, and this bit across here is because the chimney breast is being taken out and we need to support the chimney above it. So that's, that's some of the steels. There's also uh, on these drawings, there's another steel, which is uh, the ridge beam. So this goes all the way across the middle of the house because we're taking the roof off and we're having to put the dormer at the back, which is a big square structure. And this ridge beam here will support the new weight and the new structure. So you've got all of that. In addition to those steel drawings, the structural engineer will also do some detailed calculations and that will be 10 or 15 pages which show all the weight and the load and all the additional pressure that's going to be put onto your property and explaining how that load is dispersed across the existing structure to make sure that your house isn't going to collapse when it's built. So really technical isn't something you can do yourself. You have to get somebody who's a qualified structural engineer to do it. It isn't the builder and it isn't the guy who did these drawings. He's an architect. That's something different. So it's sometimes difficult to find the structural engineer because you expect the architect to do it. They don't. And they don't generally have people uh, employed to do that. So again, go on the internet, put, I need a structural engineer. You'll find various sites where you'll be able to send your job to 10, 15 different structural engineers. Again, put in, give me an indication of the cost. They'll come back to you with an indication of the cost, when they can do it, uh, and speak to them and, and find the one that you want. Some of them take a long time. So I've had guys who've taken you know six weeks to give me drawings. That's too slow. Um, I've found other people who can do it in, in three or four days. Um, and you need to really just gauge it. Again, with the price... Uh, you can pay a fortune for this sort of thing. Some some of the firms will want to charge you thousands of pounds, so four or five thousand um, pounds. I've had the, these ones here. I've done were uh, these these ones here. They came in about six hundred pounds. So it's quite a big spread of cost. So you need to do a bit of research, find the right people, and then get those drawings done. Once you've got those drawings done, then you're at the point where you could start the build. So those drawings give the builder all the detail for the steels, which he can then construct. However, you won't be able to start the build if, unless you live in a detached house. So in a detached house, you can build what you like uh, in the loft because you're not touching a wall that's owned by anybody else. If you don't live in an, if you live in a semi-detached house or a terraced house or a townhouse, then your wall, one of your walls, will be what they call a party wall, which is where two people have ownership of the same wall. So generally, it's the wall down the middle of the house that your the house on the other side to you is is on. If you're in a terraced house, uh, in a mid terraced house, then you may you'll have two party walls because both sides of your house are attached to somebody else's house. To do any work involving the party wall, then you have to have a party wall discussion with your neighbour. Uh, which is um, is always a tricky issue. So just going back to this drawing here, 
we can see that um, on this section down the middle here, which is the, the this is the party wall in this house where the chimneys are. These bits here where we've got a bit of detail, these are called they're spreader plates and they're being fixed into the party wall. So to fix these in, you have to you have to cut out some bricks from the middle wall and then you, the steel goes in and sits on top of a, of a metal plate to support this whole beam on one end. So anything that involves doing work on that party wall means you have to agree what's going to happen with your neighbour. Now, party wall agreements and party wall discussions are a huge bone of contention. Uh, I've known people who've been really friendly with their neighbours. Uh, however, when they come to talk about doing an extension or a party wall agreement, um, the whole thing just goes out the window and you can get some really petty, difficult discussions. I've had people falling. I've seen people fall out, uh, hand back Christmas presents for the kids, those sort of things. Really incredible um, because it, it's just a, some people get really quite touchy about anything that involves what they see as their property. Now, the good news is the Party Wall Act, it allows you to do work on the party wall. So you are legally entitled to use your side of that party wall to do the work that you want to do as long as you follow the procedures in the Act. And the procedures in the Act, and there's lots of information on the internet, so you can go off and read up on it in more detail, but the Act basically says that you have to talk to your neighbour and your neighbour can either, you have to notify him of or her of what work you're doing. So you need to get the details. So you'll have to get these drawings and you need to print, either you can do this yourself or I would recommend getting somebody who knows what they're doing to do it because it's quite a legal issue. And if you get it wrong, then you might have to do it all twice. But Essentially, you have to issue a letter to your neighbour saying, I would like to do a loft conversion and it involves some work on the party wall. And you generally give them a little bit of detail. So it might say, I need to put some fixings on the party wall in, in the example I just showed you there. Um, your neighbour then has the option of agreeing to that. So they can countersign the letter saying, OK, I acknowledge your acknowledgement and uh, I'm happy for you to proceed. Or they can say, actually, um, I, I'm aware that you're going to do it, but I'm not 100% happy. So I'd like um, you to do what they call a schedule of condition, which is uh, where you get an expert to go around and they take photographs of your neighbor's house inside and out to document the exist existing position of it. And then in the future, after you've done the work, if a whole load of cracks appear or things start falling off or the wall starts falling down, then they've got photographic evidence to prove what it was like before you started and therefore it's your problem and you have to pay to fix it. So that's a schedule of condition. That's a sort of starting middle ground. Um, the neighbour can go one step further than that. If you're not happy with just the photographic evidence, they can, have, they can ask for um, a party wall agreement to be put in place. And that agreement is written by a qualified surveyor and it basically goes into uh, a lot of more detail. So it still has all the photographs in it, but it documents everything and puts down all the ins and outs of how everything will work relating to the work and the remedial work and any problems that you have along the way. So that's the next option that your neighbour has is to ask for that. The final option is that they say, actually, I don't, I'm not happy with any of this work. I don't want you to do any of it. So I'm dissenting. If they dissent, then what happens is they have the right to ask for an independent surveyor. So your surveyor, who's done the photographic evidence and issued the letter, uh, remains your surveyor. They then have their own surveyor uh, who comes in and does exactly the same thing, but is independent. So that they feel that they're not biased towards you. So they do the same photographic evidence. And then in the future, if you have a problem and you say, I don't agree that these cracks were my fault or I'm not paying for any of this remedial work, then they, they have the option of a third surveyor coming in and adjudicating on the argument between your surveyor and the neighbour surveyor. So that's the worst case scenario. The, the bottom line in all of this is that you have to pay for all of it. So you pay for your initial surveyor to issue the letter to your neighbour and do the schedule of condition if needed and the party wall agreement if needed. 
Um, if they ask for their own surveyor, you have to pay for that. And if a third surveyor comes in to adjudicate, you have to pay for that as well. And the reason for that is that this is all for your benefit. You want the loft conversion doing, your neighbour doesn't. Uh, so they say, well, you have to pay for all of it. The very best option on all of this is to talk to your neighbour, keep them in the loop, try to keep it friendly and get them ideally to agree that they're happy for the work to go ahead and just countersign the letter. Um, that's the best option. Um, not telling your neighbour, just putting something through the letterbox, letting the surveyor turn up without any notice are all bad options. Don't do any of that because what will happen is your neighbour will be cheesed off and will then be awkward. And it, it's it's not fun. I've, I've worked on houses where the neighbour has objected constantly. So anytime you try to do some work, they're out, they stop the, they stop the builders, you have to go round, they call the police. It's just, it can be an absolute nightmare. And it, it's a storm in a teacup, all of it, because uh, the actual work that you're doing on the party wall is pretty minimal for a loft, but you have to make sure you've done the right paperwork and you have to keep them in, in, in the loop. Uh, and generally, um, you know, if, if you tell people in advance what you're doing, then that's great. If they've already done a loft, then they may already have it, know what, be aware of it and be happy. Um, but yeah, some, sometimes if you've got, um, you know, neighbours that don't know you very well or uh, haven't done the work or maybe are a bit jealous of you doing the work, then you might come across a problem. Anyway, the party wall agreement, worst case, if your neighbour objects and makes you go through all the hoops we talked about just then, it can take up to six weeks to get everything because you have to give them notice, wait for two weeks, give them another notice, wait for some more time. So minimum, if your neighbor's objecting, it can take six weeks. It can take longer. If they do things that are awkward and, and come back to you at the end of the two weeks and say, I'm not happy, I want this, I want that, it restarts the clock. Um, I've known deals where there's, you know, it's, it's taken six months to get the party wall agreement sorted out. If you've got two neighbors, then obviously there's a potential for double trouble. Um, it's always better to talk to them, keep them informed and, and let everybody feel that it's more collaborative. Once the party wall is out of the way and signed, that's the end of it with the neighbour and you can then crack on with the build. So you've got the party wall all sorted out. So you've got, so you've then got your drawings from initially, you've got your steel drawings, you've got your party wall agreement in place, you've got your builder lined up, you've got everything ready to go, you've got your cash all, all ready, um, uh, but that's not the end of it. So... The, the other two issues you've got relate to the council. So the first issue is planning permission or permitted development. Now you've probably never heard of permitted development, but permitted development uh, is uh, something that was in, introduced a long time ago, 15, 20 years ago, uh, to enable people to do building work to their house without having to get planning permission. Now there are certain rules and restrictions on that, but for a lot of properties, you can do what you want to do without getting planning permission. Now, if you live in a detached house, then you can you don't have to bother with, bother with the party wall, as we said, but you can um, build quite a large loft space without having to get planning permission. So you can put up to 40, sorry, sorry up to 50 cubic meters and cubic meters is length times width times height. Uh, and obviously in a loft, it's not all, it's not square. So you need to get somebody to calculate the cubic meterage because if it's a pitched roof with reducing head height, then the cubic meterage won't be the same as it is for a square room. Um, but if you can do up to 50 cubic meters without having to get permission for that, so that's great. If you live in a house that's joined to another house, then you can do 40 cubic meters which is still reasonable, but not huge. So if you've got a big loft space, you might need to make, uh, it might make it bigger than 40 cubic meters. If you can do it within the permitted development rules, and there's quite a few different other rules. So if you go on the internet, type in permitted development loft conversion, you'll see the rules, but it's things like, um, you can't build the room any higher than your existing ridge height. So the height of your roof, you can't make your roof higher to make it bigger. You can't build forward of the property, so you can't have things overhanging the front of your building. Uh, equally, at the back, you can't have overhanging. You have to, there's certain restrictions on windows. If you've got a window overlooking the side of your neighbour, you might have to have it obscured glazing. Um, so there's some restrictions, but 
generally speaking, it's, it's quite flexible. So you might be able to do it without planning permission. If that's the case, if it's permitted development, then you don't have to submit any drawings to the council. You can, if you submit the drawing to the council, then you'll get what's known as a certificate of lawfulness, which just basically proves what you've built was within the rules and is lawful. And sometimes when you're selling your property, uh, lawyers will ask for that just to just for peace of mind that it's legal structure. If it isn't permitted development and uh, the reasons for not being permitted development would be if it's too big or you live in a, a conservation area or a listed building or something that has some restrictions on it, then you'll need to get planning permission. Planning permission basically means that you have to submit these drawings that we looked at earlier. So they all have to go to the council. So all, all of these ones, they go to the draw, they go to the council. Um, you have to submit it. You can do it yourself. Uh, I do these frequently myself. Um, but usually the architect that you've had do the drawings is happy to do that for you because they have to fill in the forms and tick up certain boxes and provide things like a site plan which shows where your house is located and which road, um, which you might not have. So if you get your surveyor to submit it, it goes to the council and then most councils uh, have a requirement to give you a response within eight weeks. In my experience, that means that you get a response in eight weeks, no earlier than eight weeks. Um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time chasing these things, hoping that I was going to come back in three or four weeks. Never does. And if they've got a minimum requirement of eight weeks, usually it's eight weeks. It, they take the full eight weeks. So don't expect to get it earlier um, and start the build. You, you, you'll, you'll be disappointed. So you submit the plans, make sure that you're going to get approval. And what I mean by saying that is have a look on the website. So you go onto your council's website and put planning application search in. You'll be able to see all the other properties on your road and in your area. Have a look at those properties and see what they've had approved. And your build should be similar to that because the council and planners like to work on what they call a precedent, which means they don't want to be the first guys to approve something that's never been approved before. They want a precedent of, well, this was done by the guys three doors down last, last year. Therefore, it's OK for you to do it. So always go with whatever's been done before. If you're doing something groundbreaking, something that's never you've never seen before, that is weird and wonderful, then that might be OK. But in my experience, they take a lot longer to get approved and sometimes never get approved. So if you want to do something that is a surefire bet, go with something that you've seen other people do and that you know will be approved. If you want to do something that's uh, it's going to be on the front page of a property magazine, great. But, you know, make sure you've got enough time to, to factor in that you might not get the sign off within eight weeks for that. OK, so once you've submitted to the council, you've got your planning permission. You've then got your builder, you've got your drawings, you've got your steels, you've got your party wall all done. The very last thing that you need before you can start is building control. Now, building control is part of the council. It, there's also some private ones, but let's talk about the council first. It's part of the council and they are there to ensure that what is built is legal and correct. So, as an example, they you have to send them these drawings of the steels. So they will get this. They are qualified surveyors, these building control guys. They will assess this. They'll look at the calculations that come with it. They'll do the work and then they will come and make sure that your builder has built it correctly in this way. They will check all the joints. They'll check all the different um, preparation and the finish and make sure that your house is not going to fall down and that it's, uh, it's safe. Building control is really important for you as a homeowner because you want to make sure that somebody independent is checking your builder's work. So that's good. Um, it's also important because if you come to sell your house, you won't be able to sell it if you've done any work and you didn't have any building control completion certificate to sign off on it. Because th what you're saying is we've no idea whether it was legal and whether it's, um, it's, it's safe. And if you can't provide that when you sell it, then your buyer will, will pull out. They won't be able to get a mortgage against your property. So building control is really important. You have to give the council two or three days notice. So 
If, again, you fill in a form online, so you can go onto your council website, you can fill in building control application form, you have to send them these drawings, and then they need two or three days notice before you can start the work. There is another option. Uh, building control was deregulated a number of years ago, so there are lots of private companies who do building control. And you might find that your builder says, oh, let's use a private company because uh, we use them all the time. Um, that's fine. They are good. Uh, they can be more flexible than the council in terms of coming out to do inspections. Uh, just make sure that it isn't the builder's mate who is doing it because they want extra fees and it's easier for the builder and he's not going to come out and check it. He just takes it on the say so that the builder said he did it because the risk with that as a homeowner is obviously if it isn't done properly and nobody's checked it and it's in your house and it's dangerous then you know, you're the ones who are going to suffer from it. So make sure that you're happy with the building control company that you use. I personally would always use the council because they're cheaper, um, it's a lower cost, and they're very straight. That you know, there's nothing in it for them to to let people get away with uh, sloppy workmanship. You know, they will stick to the rules, which is what you want when it's your house. And um, it's it. And I've always found them to have availability. Uh, it might be a day or two that you wait for them to come out, but generally you can you can you can afford that. So um, yeah, I, I, I would recommend the local council building control, but um, private building control is fine as well. Just make sure that you get the completion certificate once the work's finished, because you'll need that for selling your house. So that's everything that you need to know to start with, and they haven't even started the build there. So basically, check your roof, that it's possible. And generally, if your neighbors have done it, it'll be okay for you, but just have a quick look before you do that. Then you're gonna to have to work out rough cost. So you think, well, it's, you know, in my experience, 50,000 is a, is, a, is a ballpark middle figure. You might pay a lot more than that. You'd be lucky to pay much less than that these days. So it's not cheap, but it does add a lot of value to your house and gives you a lot more space. Then you need to get the drawings, both the drawings of the property, then the structural drawings. You need to find your builder, get some quotes. Once you've got your quotes and you've worked and you've done due diligence, worked out which builder is the best one for you, then you can do your party wall discussions, make sure your neighbours are happy, get everybody comfortable on that side of things, sort out your planning permission, and then get building control in. And then start the build. And we'll talk about that in some future videos. But good luck with all of that. Okay, bye for now.